Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to just begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands and islands that make up Australia. Um, I particularly want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Ngunnawal country where I live here in Canberra and where Parliament meets and decisions are made. Um, I personally look forward to the day that Australia's First Nations people regain a strong voice in the decisions that affect how we all live. And I want to acknowledge Elders past and present and their enduring connection to country, no matter how it changes. Um, I want to begin by welcoming you to the first part um, of two webinars that are being co-hosted today and Friday by the National Environmental um, Science Programs Climate Adaptation Cross Hub Program and Griffith University's Climate Action Be Beacon. Uh, my name is Sarah Bolter. I'm an Associate Professor of Climate Adaptation at the University of Tasmania, and I lead the uh, National Environmental Science Programs Climate Adaptation Cross Hub Program. Um, the Climate Adaptation uh, Cross Hub Program is, has been set up to drive integrated climate change adaptation research across the NEST program. Um, and we're really seeking to support evidence-based decision-making to help Australia become uh, better adapted to climate change. I'm also um, delighted to be an associate of Griffith University's Climate Action Beacon. This is a five-year commitment by Griffith University to support the development of knowledge, leadership, capacity and responses that are needed to enable both an effective and just climate action throughout Australia, uh, throughout society. Um, the Beacon uh, very much uses a partnership approach that recognises the importance of both research and practice in defining and achieving collective climate action. It also now hosts what many of you might remember as the National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility, NCARF, and uh, my colleague, Professor Brendan Mackey is the Beacons Director. So on behalf of Brendan and myself, I'd like to thank you for joining us for this, as I said, uh, the first part of two webinars that we're presenting this week to try and help unpack the findings of the sixth assessment of the IPCC Working Group 2. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar, but Working Group 2 focuses on how climate change is already affecting society and communities, future risks, and how well we are currently adapting or preparing to adapt to climate change. This new report represents the, ev the efforts of over 270 experts who have co collectively examined over 34,000 peer reviewed publications. This is not an insignificant effort. And unfortunately the news is not good, but it's not unexpected. So in this webinar and, and following on in part two on Friday, we've been able to, um, we've been joined by two, four of the key authors for, four of the key authors who contributed to the report and they've kindly agreed to give us a brief overview of the findings and help answer some of your questions. Today's part one of the webinars focuses on observed impacts and adaptation progress and I'm delighted to introduce Professor Brendan Mackey, the, the co-lead author of the report's Australasia chapter. Brendan is an expert in climate change, forest ecosystems, biodiversity conservation, terrestrial carbon dynamic and the application of GIS, um, remote sensing and environmental modelling to problems of environment and climate change. Um, in he, uh, Brendan, as, uh, the, as I said, the co coordinating lead author of the Australasia chapter will give us um, some opening uh, perspectives on the work that was done and some key findings from that chapter. Brendan, happy to hand to you if I can, please. Thanks, thanks, Sarah. So I'll just share my screen and endeavour to get my PowerPoint up. So can I just confirm you can see my PowerPoint slide? Um, yes, great. Thanks, Brendan. Okay, thanks. And, and can you see me as well? I can. Okay. okay, good. So let me begin by also acknowledging the people who are the traditional owners on the land I'm speaking to you from. I'm situated on the Gold Coast in Queensland and stand on the land of the Yungan Bay Kumanberi peoples. And I'd like to pay my respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders uh, here today and also to any other Indigenous peoples who may be watching and listening. 
So uh, as Sarah mentioned, this is the part one of the two-part webinar that's being presented by myself and three of my colleagues who were uh, amongst the team of 11 lead authors who wrote chapter 13 in the IPCC sixth assessment report. So I'm being joined today by Professor Greta Pecky. And then on Friday, we'll be, we'll be joined by uh, Dr. Kevin Hennessy and Professor Long Rickard. Um, Kevin works for CSIRO, uh, uh, Greta for the University of Tasmania, and Lauren at RMIT. Today we'll be, and the reason why we're giving two webinars is uh, we, we are focusing mainly on what the sixth assessment report has to say for Australia. All of that information can be found in chapter 11 of the full report. And, and our chapter comes in at about 102 pages. So it's quite a comprehensive report. And for that reason, uh, we wanted to have two sessions. In the first session, uh, we're going to look at a, an overview of chapter 11, some observed impacts from climate trends and extremes. Uh, and I want to say something about how, how the IPCC looks at climate risks and this notion of risk mitigation nexus. And, and then Greta is going to look at um, um, extremes in terms of observed and projected and impacts with a particular emphasis on the marine environment, which is her particular area of expertise. And then on Friday, we will be joined by Kevin and Lauren, who are going to, Kevin will do a deeper dive into the key risks we've identified, climate related risks we've identified for our region. And, and Lauren will look at the issue of adaptation uh, and including barriers and, and limits and also the kind of adaptation we now need going forward. And there are all the lead authors for our chapter. Um, Judy Lawrence from New Zealand and I were called the coordinating lead authors. And we had, uh, the, uh, you can read the other authors there. We also had two very important chapter scientists. And I also left off, there's an error on my part, we also uh, co-opted, if I can use that term, about 30 odd experts who are called um, contributing authors. So we have CLAs, LAs and CAs. My apology for not even mentioning them on this slide, uh, let alone listing their 30 odd names. And that did include three indigenous contributing authors who made very important contributions to this report. And we also had two review editors, Ove and David Wright from New Zealand, who helped make sure that we properly and thoroughly reviewed the many thousands of independent review comments that drafts of this chapter received. For those of you who aren't familiar with the IPCC, it's an intergovernmental organization of 195 members of the world. Um, that should be the World Meteorological organization, not the World Health Organization, another typographic error. The objective is to provide governments with scientific information to help develop policies and inform climate policies. And, and the assessment reports um, are, are approved by governments. And, and these have assessed scientific publications um, published since the previous assessment that identified progress and knowledge, the strength of, the, of what the science is telling us, and also any gaps. And, and these publications, these assessment reports are all, uh, all open to multiple open and transparent reviews of draft text by experts and governments around the world. Just to clarify the, what, what we call the main report, which is this 3,600 page document is subject to peer review, which include government experts, but it's not a negotiated text. The authors hold the pen when it comes to that full report. There's a high level synthesis document called the summary for policymakers, which is about 20 pages long, which translates all of that scientific assessment into what is intended to be more plain English policy relevant language. And that document is co-written 
co-drafted with government representatives. And when that document is um, finalized and, and approved by both the authors and the government representatives, then, then the summary for poly policymakers and the underlying full report with its 18 chapters is also formally adopted by governments. So this is one of the powerful things about the IPCC process is that the science assessments are formally ad adopted by our governments. Uh, and, and the IPCC is organized into three working groups. The first looks at the physical science basis of climate change. That report came out last August. That looked at what do we know about the current state of the Earth's climate, how it's being influenced by humans, and, and, and what, how it might change in the future given what humans do or don't, don't do. The report we're talking about today is from Working Group 2. Its focus is climate change impacts, adaptation and vulnerability, and it's been released. Well, it was released on Monday night. And, and then there's the Working Group 3 report, which is looking at mitigation of climate change, i.e. what do we do about greenhouse gas emissions, and that's going to be released in April. Finally, there's a, the highest level of, of, of reporting. It's the last of the ARC products. That's the synthesis of all three working group reports, which we released in September. So here we are, working group two, the sixth assessment report. There's three main products. The main report, which is about 3,600 pages long, a technical summary, which as it suggests is a summary of the kind of technical aspects. And then the summary for policymakers, which, which, which is this high level co-drafted co document, um, uh, which, which is about 20 pages long. So in total, there were 270 authors from 67 countries. The gender balance was nearly 50%, not quite, a few percent more male. Uh, there were a total of a, you know, just over 34,000 scientific publications were assessed by the authors and a total of over 62,000 independent review comments. And each of those review comments had to be given a written reply and it's all entered into a giant spreadsheet and that's uh, all made available to the public. Here are the 18 chapters in working group one and you see in the middle, there's chapter 11 which is Australasia. I'll just point out this from my perspective is something of an anomaly. Uh, it, it stem, so if you look at the regions, we've got Africa, Asia, Australia, Europe, North America, Central and South America and small islands. Why does Australia and New Zealand get their own chapter? A good question. It's a historical artifact of what the UN global regions were back in the late 1980s. Um, my suggestion is uh, it would be better if uh, for the seventh assessment report, Australia and New Zealand were part of Oceania. But nonetheless, we're fortunate in having to have had a lot of resources just focused what's, on what's happening here. Uh, this is what our chapter looks like. We have main sections looking at observed and projected climate change, observed and projected impacts of the observed climate change, observed and projected adaptation in response to the observed impacts and projected impacts. And when we talk about projected impacts in the future, we, we use risk terminology for that. So we talk about observed impacts and projected risks. We also have suggest, um, sections on indigenous people, key risks and benefits, enabling adaptation decision-making and climate resilient development pathways. For observed and projected impacts and adaptation, we did that by sector and I've listed all the sectors there. It includes different ecosystem types, but all different, uh, as well as different economic sectors. And we have boxes which gave more detailed information about wildfire, Great Barrier Reef, Marine Darling Basin, flood risk and sea level rise. So let me, uh, for the rest of my talk, just give you some of the high level impacts regarding Observe, um, observed and projected climate change and impacts. Well, one, 
one important uh, conclusion or, rec or, or, or assessment is that we have on ongoing climate trends um, have exacerbated many, many extreme events. Trends include further warming and sea level rise, more hot days and heat waves, less snow, more rainfall in the north and less April, October rainfall in the southwest and southeast and more extreme fire weather days in the south and east. Extreme events include some of the, some of the mega events that we've seen there. So these climate trends and extreme events, uh, and overall we've seen an uh, increase in the severity and duration or severity or duration um, or frequency of, of these extreme events. They've combined with exposure and vulnerability to cause major impacts for many of our natural and human systems with some of our natural systems experiencing or at risk of irreversible change in Australia. And we're gonna be hearing about some of them from Greta shortly, particularly in, in relation to the marine environment. But I, but I will mention that the, um, uh, the brain, the brain on, um, uh, melamus, indigenous mammal um, has got extinct and, and there's a climate change factor there because its uh, habitat was washed away from a combination of sea level rise and storm surges in the Torres Strait. And the extreme events such as heat waves, droughts, flood storms and fires have had huge impacts, caused deaths and injuries, affected many household communities and businesses, fire impacts on ecosystems, critical infrastructure, essential services, food production, the national economy, valued places and employment. And in our chapter, we, we provide a lot of quantitative information about exactly uh, how these impacts have been felt. In terms, in terms of future warming, now that's a little, that little graph in the middle should not be there. Just let me remove that. Ongoing warming is projected with more hot days and fewer cold days. Uh, snow retreat and in New Zealand glacier retreat, sea level rise and ocean acidification. So in Australia, it's projected we'll have more extreme fire weather in southern and eastern Australia. High rainfall intensity is projected to increase with increased magnitude of flooding. Sorry, Brendan, can we just get you to go to screen uh, slideshow view again? Just sure. thank you. My apologies. More extreme fire weather in southern and eastern Australia. High rainfall intensity is project. Heavy rainfall intensity is projected to increase, as with the magnitude of flooding, yet with more droughts over southern and eastern Australia, particularly during the winter months. Again, reflecting the diversity of being an island continent. However, and this is where I'm going to stop to hand over to my colleague, the degree of global warming. The associated increase in climate trends and extreme events and the impacts this has on our natural and human systems and the future climate risks these will bring us really depend on two factors. They depend, first of all, on the success of global mitigation efforts, of which Australia has a key role to play. And they also depend upon the extent to which we now begin to implement effective adaptation action and the kind of adaptation that's needed given the risks we now face. Just to conclude, and uh, Kevin will really do a deep dive on this on Friday, um, we identified nine key risks for Australia and I just need to remove that bar at the top, sorry. Uh, there's, a, there's a banner missing. We've identified nine key risks. They range from risks to our natural environment through to what we call implementation risks, uh, the, uh, the failure of institutions and governance to manage climate risks. And uh, Kevin will talk more about these on Friday, but these are called burning ember figures. For each risk, we identify how the risk is projected to increase with different le levels of global warming and whether we have low or moderate adaptation, they also illustrate where we hit the limits of adaptation. So what we find is that we have some 
of our natural systems already at a tipping point, already at a very high level of risk, already at a tipping point. We have some risks where their future is uncertain and whether they go into high level of risk or not, or very high level, depends very much on our, on our adaptive capacity and the level of global warming. And then we have these implementation risks where the answer really lies, the solution really lies fully in our hands as a society in terms of how we organize ourselves. So that's where I'll end my presentation. I've, I've tried to give you a, a overview. I'm just having trouble getting out of this presentation. Maybe if I do this. And I can stop sharing. I've given you an overview of the IPCC process, an overview of the report, overview of our chapter, just some of the main high level findings. I hope I've given you a good framework for the, the, the presentation that Greta is going to give today. And then that, which is looking more on, on the extremes and the marine environment. Then on Friday, Kevin will do a deep dive into the risks and, and Lauren will really address this issue of adaptation and what that now means in this climate change world. So I'll hand back to you now. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, thanks very much, Brendan. That was um, a great, fantastic int introduction. And I think it's useful pe for people to understand the, the um, significance of the process in developing these reports. I'm just going to remind everyone, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your uh, um, Zoom screen. And I'd like to introduce our second speaker um, this afternoon, Professor Greta Peckle. She's a specialist um, in climate change ecology from the University of Tasmania. She is studying what is happening to species in our oceans as the water warms. To also improve the quantity of data being collected, she's enlisted the help of thousands of recreational fishers, scuba divers, boaters and naturalists to produce a citizen science model called Red Map or Range Extension Database of Mapping Project. She was obviously a very crucial um, contributor to the Australasia chapter and um, I welcome Greta to speak now um, a, a little bit about her contribution to the report. Thanks, Greta. Great. Um, thanks very much, Sarah and Brendan. Um, as Sarah and Brendan mentioned, my name is Greta Petzl, um, and I was one of the lead authors for Chapter 11. I wanted to acknowledge my uh, co-authors co because some of the slides that I'll present today um, are, are from those as well. I'm speaking today from Nipaluna Lutralita, and I'd like to acknowledge the Muanina people specifically, um, but also the Indigenous contributing authors that contributed valuable knowledge to this report. So as Brendan mentioned, in addition to the lead authors that you saw on his slide, there's also a team of contributing authors that contribute particular expertise in particular areas. Um, and four of those across the two countries were Indigenous scholars, three from Australia. And I should add as well, one of our hosts today, Sarah Bolter, was also a contributing author um, on the Australasian chapter. So some of the work that you'll see today is from her efforts as well. As um, Brendan, Brendan highlighted, extreme events like heat waves and droughts are, are really um, you know, headlining the IPCC report as a whole for every region around the world and in particular Australia. One of those key risks was obviously the, the changing flood risk. And I guess a lot of the information that you know, we'll present across these webinars are in many ways, you know, things that everybody here will be very familiar with. And I guess the value of the Working Group 2 report is really to try and assess all of that literature, add confidence statements with our calibrated language that's very highly regulated in terms of what's high confidence, medium confidence, all of those sorts of things, and, and really put it in, in one spot. But one of those um, risks that was you know, identified in, in the report was that extreme high rainfall will become more intense. And unfortunately, many of you are experiencing that um, right now. So the flood risk will increase in cities and urban areas and small catchments. And the flood response in rural areas will depend on changes to high extreme rainfall uh, and catchment conditions. And, Again, as we've unfortunately seen, adaptation to changing flood risks is currently mostly reactive and incremental in response to floods. So there's some work to be done there in terms of um, planning. Floods are one of the most expensive extreme events that we have 
Uh, in, in Australia, it's around $8.8 .8 billion annually that floods uh, cost us. And that's obviously in addition to the very substantial human cost um, that these, these uh, extreme events are, are causing here in Australia. Escalating impact and risks of fires is another one that we are also way too familiar with, with the frequency and severity of, of dangerous fire weather conditions increasing and, and definitely continuing to increase. That they, these events obviously have a cascading impact on people and economic uh, activity and ecosystems and species. And it's one example of what I think um, Lauren will talk a lot about in the second webinar around comp compounding and aggregate impacts from fires and floods. And each one of these events, um, these extreme events are so complicated with so many different flow on effects, but we're now seeing these one on top of the other or different events at different parts of the country at the same time. And it really is leading to very complicated um, issues around infrastructure and supply chains and, and supply chains and all sorts of issues. If we just look at the fire, issue, for example, the 2019-2020 fires and, and this, you know, bullet point list that I've got here, we could have had multiple, you know, three or four slides with all of these um, points on it, but things like, you know, 33 deaths and over 3,000 homes lost, 2.3 billion in insured losses, um, displacement of or loss of, of nearly 3 billion vertebrate animals, let alone all the other um, plants and animals, 114 listed threatened species lost at least 50% of their habitat and smoke um, from these fires, you know, creating cascading impacts in, in New Zealand where they increase the snow and the, and the glacier melt. Um, and then, you know, all sorts of issues like the, the um, infrastructure being affected for the banking system and all sorts of flow on effects that we, we may not have necessarily um, thought of that are creating all sorts of compounding and, and, and um, flow on problems. And then when we look at uh, marine systems, specifically another one of the, the key risks that were identified in the Australasian report, and this was again with um, very high confidence, is that significant loss and degradation of, of coral reefs and the associated biodiversity and the ecosystem services. We've had three marine heat waves in the Great Barrier Reef just in five years, 2016, 2017, 2020, and that accumulated thermal stress is what leads to the, to the bleaching conditions. And if, those, if that thermal stress is maintained for a longer period of time, then that leads to, to coral death. We know that the recovery of coral reefs following these disturbances is, is very slow. It takes a minimum of 10 years for the very fastest of corals to at least partially recover. So those um, that recovery of these systems can be can be quite prolonged. And then in we know that other processes like the capacity of the reef to replenish itself are severely impacted by these events. So in 2018, the recruitment of coral or production of new coral to, to lead to, to replenishment of these systems um, was reduced to only 11% of the long-term um, average. And although these figures that I've mentioned here relate to the Great Barrier Reef specifically, these risks apply um, to our, our coral reefs in Western Australia as well. If we look at um, temperate systems, it's not a good news story there either, with the loss of kelp forests in, in southern Australia due to ocean warming and marine heat waves, um, you know, attributed to as a, as a high confidence as well. In Tasmania, less than 10% of the giant kelp um, was remaining by 2011 due to ocean warming. Uh, and a, well, a combination of ocean warming, a change in current system with the East, East Australian current pushing further down the coast and leading to nutrient poorer waters, and then the overgrazing by urchins and, um, and fish. So climate driven range extensions of other species moving into those, into those regions. The west of the country, again, has also been affected by, by these impacts with extreme marine heat waves leading to 100 kilometre range contraction of kelp forests in WA. And if we look across the whole southern coast of the country, it's at least 140,000 hectares of different kelp species that have been lost altogether across the country. And these changes uh, have led to, to very significant changes in ecosystem structure and function and the distribution of really key habitats, habitat types. 
So extreme climatic events over that 2011 to 2017 period have led to extensive and abrupt mortality of key habitat form forming organisms, corals, kelps, seagrasses, mangroves, uh, around 45% of our Australian coastline have experienced impacts um, leading to, to loss of these kinds of, of species. The impacts of climate change in marine systems, though, are much more pervasive and more general um, than this. We've had new occurrences and increased prevalence of diseases, toxins, viruses. The Pacific Oyster Mortality Syndrome here in, in Tasmania is one example of that, detected for the first time uh, in a heat wave and, and led to uh, around 90% of, of the um, oyster production for one of our aquaculture system, uh, one of our aquaculture industries here being lost more or less overnight. But we're also seeing many, many different kinds of species that are changing distributions. There's almost 200 species from across nine phyla that have been documented to be shifting distributions around the Australian coastline since 2003. And actually one of the um, headline statements that came out of the broader you know, report as a whole was that out of all the studied species um, that have, where we've looked at changes in distribution, around half of those have been documented across the planet to be changing distribution with plants and animals in the Northern Hemisphere moving north and the Southern Hemisphere moving south. Um, not, not changing um, you know, what they prefer, but just trying to keep track with, with their preferred environmental conditions, but different species can do that at different rates. And that leads to all sorts of flow on implications with um, connections between species being lost and new ones being made. And that leading to, to many different um, implications for our ecosystems. In terms of projected risks for marine systems, even temporarily exceeding that 1.5 degree of warming for, for a decade or two, will result in severe and potentially irreversible impacts. That was one of our, our main um, assessments for the Australasian chapter with a very high confidence, um, in particular related to the Great Barrier Reef. Globally, bleaching conditions are projected to occur twice each decade from 2035 and annually after 20, 2044 under a high emission scenario. And with uh, minimal recovery time or minimal recovery time for minimal recovery um, of about 10 years, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that this, this um, scenario won't play out well for the Great Barrier Reef. Further ecosystem degradation and, and loss will obviously threaten livelihoods and coastal protection and, and cultural values in particular. And if bleaching persists, in addition to the, the um, ecosystem and, and the cultural losses, an estimated 10,000 jobs and a billion dollars in revenue would be lost each year from declines in tourism alone. If we consider adaptation for a minute, unfortunately, uh, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees is insufficient to prevent more frequent mass bleaching events, but it may actually reduce the occurrence of, of warming events equivalent to the 2016 um, warming event by around an estimated 25%. Reducing other anthropogenic pressures on, on the Great Barrier Reef can obviously help improve adaptive capacity, but it is important to recognise that adaptation efforts, so for example, coral restoration, which may slow impacts in small discrete regions or may reduce short-term socioeconomic um, ramifications, will not prevent widespread bleaching. Um, reducing emissions and, and getting the temperature down is the only thing that will, will reduce that risk of um, of widespread bleaching or will prevent widespread bleaching. In terms of kelp and adaptation options, minimising other stresses, local restoration and transplanting of heat tolerant phenotypes. Um, and an example there is, is a project that we have here at the Institute for Marine Antarctic Studies with Dr. Kane Layton, transplanting heat tolerant um, phenotypes into, into, uh, back into systems. These are obviously very um, worthwhile adaptation options, but we do need to recognise there that those kelp systems will remain at great risk from climate change, even if we, if we um, introduce these adaptation options. It's not a, a permanent um, fix. If we look at fisheries and aquaculture just quickly, there are adaptation efforts um, underway within our industries using seasonal forecasts for um, environment, to use environmental condition predictions for improving decision-making and risk management business 
business planning, those sorts of things. However, there are um, likely to be potential social and economic adjustment costs to shifting stocks, for example, um, oceanic tuna moving very large distances. Um, that comes with significant costs to, to, to adjust and to adapt to our industries and, and potential disruption to supply chains as well. When um, we look at fisheries management plans and, and how these are considered at the moment, less than a quarter of fisheries management plans for 99 of Australia's most important fisheries, so fisheries that are um, ecologically, economically, socially important, less than a quarter of those actually had any consideration of climate change in their management plans. And of that quarter, um, the ones that did consider climate change, it was usually only to a very limited degree. Fortunately, some stakeholders are already adapting autonomously, but planned adaptation is very patchy and much more needs to be done to ensure that we have thriving uh, future industries and systems. And I think that might be all from me. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Greta, and to you, Brendan, as well. I mean, it's hard, I guess, at the moment to hear more <laughs> difficult news, but it's really important that, that we are getting to grips with what's happening. Um, so just a reminder for our audience, you can put your questions in um, the Q&A. I'm going to begin with John Rainbird's question. I'm going to start with you, Brendan, if I can, and Greta, that'll give you time to think because I'm going to ask you to respond as well. So, I mean, one of the things that I really noticed from this report was that it's talking more about um, climate change as the present more so than the future. But I'm, so I'm interested to know from your perspective what you see are the key changes from this report compared to previous reports. And then, uh, Greta, I'll ask you the same question. Yes, uh, that's a very good question. And, and for me, there's uh, a couple of big differences between our five in 2014, and here we are, our six, eight, eight years later. Well, one is uh, this you know, documented increase in the frequency or severity or duration of many extreme weather events. The at least partial formal attribution of these to human influence climate change and the documented impacts from these in every region of the world. So that would be one, one major difference. Uh, a second major difference is the additional focus given in AR6, current assessment, to the interactions between humans and, and nature. And the interdependencies between human health and well-being and livelihoods and healthy ecosystems and, and the contribution of ecosystem services um, to many of the sustainable development goals and how these are at risk from you know, un, unmitigated global warming. So, so they are definitely two. A, a third which I think is relevant here is the, um, again, observed you know, increase in adaptation uh, at all levels of government and in all sectors. Uh, it's it's um, a, a major shift from 2014, uh, particularly at state government level, where uh, every state government has, has both mitigation and adaptation plans but what we did document was that the implementation is, is very uneven. Um, but you know, that, that to me is another major, major difference that we've documented and, 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 and reported on here. Yeah, so there, great, there's, thanks. There's three big differences. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks, Brenda. What about from your perspective, Greta? I'm just gonna quickly share my screen because um, oh, I've shared the wrong. Why is it doing that? He, he's a slider prepared <laughs> yeah. earlier. Is this what yes. you're going to no, say to us? No, I showed this last night um, at an event in in Hobart because I think if you're part of the climate community, we get a bit of creep and you kind of forget um, how much has happened in a short space of time. But if you look at the IPCC reports from 1990, it was you know, broad overview of climate change science, discussing uncertainties, 
1995, the balance of evidence suggests a discernible influence, uh, you know, human influence. 2001, stronger evidence attributed to human activities. 2007, warming of the climate system is unequivocal. unequivocal. 2013, human influence on the climate system is clear. Um, so, you know, over that time, the language has gotten a, a, a lot stronger, um, but the, the language being used, you know, at the launch on Monday night was incredibly strong. One of the UN officials, I couldn't, couldn't sort of catch which, which one, used the word criminal. Um, at, at, I don't know if you caught that. It was the Director General of the United Nations General Assembly. Yeah, so the language is, in terms of how strong it is, has just been a you know, massive kind of change. A fourth, um, I agree completely with Greta, and, and a fourth major difference is we now have evidence of both some observed impacts on some natural and some humans, or well, certainly of some natural systems, be, being at these thresholds of, they're either, they're either at the threshold, close to the threshold, some of them might have even passed the threshold and we won't know until we get more data of, of, of um, you know, transiting or flipping into a different system state and tropical coral reefs, jello coral reefs are, are the ones already at the highest level of risk, at very high risk for, uh, for this reason. And that's new, this idea of, can I just say something very technical about tipping points and thresholds because it's important. If you're a system modeler, a threshold, a, a tipping point is when you cross the threshold and it triggers a positive feedback, right? So melting, melting um, um, uh, permafrost in the Arctic will release greenhouse gases, which will accelerate global warming. Uh, but what we are, and we are seeing that, but what we are seeing in Australia, is certainly systems like tropical coral reefs are either at or over this threshold where, where um, it, it, their natural adaptive capacity is or will be exceeded and they will be flipped into a very different system state. There are some terrestrial systems where that too might be the case. Pencil pine in Tasmania, um, if you go down there now, it, you know, there's vast areas that have not regenerated, pencil pine. Um, and, and snow gum woodlands also um, from, from, from repeated intense wildfire might be transitioning into conification trouble. So this is, this is new. This is very new compared to 2014. Yeah, and a follow-up question, and maybe Greta, you might want to speak to this because this follows from your slide. You know, are we seeing the, um, the comments gaining in confidence so that that you know what we're saying in terms, for example, you know those those comments around the thresholds for coral reefs. Are we more confident in the science in terms of where these things are going? Absolutely, yes, yes. So there has been a big change from well, not not well. We've always been very confident in terms of the coral reef risk for Great Barrier Reef that has been at a very high mm. risk for some years. But for the other systems, so kelp systems in particular, and then the other natural impacts that we're seeing in the Australian, uh, the Australian section of the Australasian chapter, and across other regions around the world, that was a really big difference for for this report. In fact, I think one of the you know headline statements, and Brendan might have already mentioned this, is that there is not a region in the world that is not experiencing these kinds of impacts with very high confidence. Yeah. Yep. Yep, that's great. Thank you both for those comments. That's Sarah, really useful. Yeah, Sarah, sorry, Brenda. I think the other thing that's new about our chapter, the more I think about it, the more that's new, <laughs> is yep. we, we have these two new kinds of risks that we've called implementation risks. Mm -hmm. And one of them is the increase in the impacts from cascading, you know, comp aggregating and, and, and compounding multiple hazards that, that, that Greta re referred to because that's new and we've already experienced this. There was, in 2018 in far north Queensland, we had an unprecedented bushfire and in the same local government area, we had, um, you know, flooding, right? So uh, this has enormous, you know, that's an enormous risk for, uh, for, uh, for many, many, many um, 
what 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 adaptation means in this context and the other flowing from that which we said the risk is the inability of our institutions and governance mechanisms to manage these increasingly complex risks so that's an institutional risk a governance risk so they are yeah. they are two new risks compared to 2014. Can I follow that thread? There's a few questions here that, um, and, and apologies to David Cole, who I was going to ask you a question next, but I will come back to that. But there's a few questions here asking around, um, without naming or shaming, you know, how are governments going in terms of their um, response and their investment in adaptation? Is that too hard? I know that I know the report touches on some of this and some of the challenges for government, and it's uneven. But did, did you want to add any comments to that? Well, again, uh, I mean, our comments have to be, I think, limited to our assessment that's in the report. And we said that the, the you know, adaptation effort has definitely risen um, everywhere. And, and we cite many concrete examples of that, um, many of which are excellent, really, really good adaptation initiatives, at, uh, I think, particularly at the state government level. The, the uh, federal government has responded more recently in terms of disaster resilience funding and, and, and planning. Um, billions more are being put into adaptation efforts for the Great Barrier Reef, recognising the impacts. The Queensland government completely remapped its coastal hazard zone to take into account sea level rise to 2080. So, you know, it, it, we, we cannot say that governments aren't doing anything, but it's clear, um, and again, this is, in our chapter, that just that that the problems, the the impacts and risks are, are, are currently out are currently outpacing, you know, our adaptation effort. So that's that's the problem whereby that's the gap. There's an adaptation gap which is actually growing. Of course, the risks are accelerating despite the increase in adaptation effort at all levels and all sectors. The gaps, the adaptation gap is still growing. Yeah, I think we could sum that up by there is a lot happening but there's a lot more that needs to be done um, and, and our systems are already being overwhelmed. And I noticed there was a question there in the chat about why are we talking about adaptation? Like we're just accepting, you know, the, the challenge and not talking about mitigation, but the bottom line is that we have to absolutely, we have no choice but to try and adapt while we have the mitigation thing also happening. It's not a question of either or, it's that we must absolutely do both. Um, at the same time. And I, I noticed Lauren's on who's presenting in the next um, webinar is, is on and she might have a, a comment to make about adaptation. I'm not sure if, if she wants to jump in there. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Greta. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This is a really, really essential point. And the main thing to um, understand about the relationship between adaptation and mitigation is that each enables each. So adaptation is needed to enable mitigation. Decarbonising of the scale and pace at which we need is hard work and hard work requires that we're in a good place and that means we need to adapt urgently. So absolutely need adaptation as the life jacket to enable us to do the hard work of mitigation. At the same time, if we don't mitigate, we're going to rapidly reach the limits of adaptation. So to give adaptation a chance of succeeding, we need to mitigate rapidly. So they're completely complementary. There are, you know, in very specific situations, uh, tensions and stuff that we need to work through, but at that broad level, uh, they're absolutely complementary. Yeah, and I, can add, and I can add that that's, you know, I threw up at the end that very busy graph, what I call the burning embers. Kevin will do a deeper dive in that on Friday along with Lauren. But, you know, one of, one of the reasons we have those burning, uh, uh, burning so-called burning ember diagrams is it, it does help illustrate this relationship Lauren and Greta just spoke of between mitigation and adaptation. For some of our risks, uh, it, it, those burning embers show you at what level of global warming we reach the limits of adaptation. It doesn't matter what we do, the system, the, you know, there, there is no adaptation that's possible. So the burning embers are an attempt to make clear that we have to do both of these in parallel. And again, I think Lauren will talk about more about this on Friday, but that's what the IPCC means when we talk about climate resilient development 
it's it's a development we have that mitigates greenhouse gas emissions sufficiently to to um, limit cap global warming and uh, takes the necessary adaptation to deal with the reality that our climate has changed. We are now living with the impacts of a of a of a of a climate change world, and and there's more climate change in the pipeline, if you like, whatever we do in terms of mitigation, because there's a certain amount of climate change already locked in for actually for centuries when it comes to the impacts like sea level rise. So adaptation is no longer optional. It's not something nice we might do. It's actually uh, has to be uh, you know, essentially you know, integrated into our planning and thinking now. Yeah, great. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I have one, one last comment. Yeah, of course. And then I've sort of got a follow-up question on that. Yep. Yeah. It, um, it costs so much to respond to these extreme events and it would actually be cheaper to do the adaptation in a planned way than it would be to just keep responding over and over and again to these extreme events. So even though it is extremely costly to try and adapt to flood risk, for example, and fire risk, that's actually a financially better decision than it is to, to, to not do it and to just spend billions and billions and billions of dollars on, on, on responding to these events instead. Yeah, and, and so just digging into that a little bit, there's a question here around what the report says on the relationship between adaptation, mitigation and land use planning in Australia or elsewhere. So, um, you know, any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, so this... Uh, again, comes down to how the IPC evaluates risk. Okay, so it, it again when we talk when we talk about future impacts, uh, it's just conventional way of thinking about risk. You know, the likelihood something is going to happen and the consequence of it. So here we're talking about climate-related risks in some way, which can be direct, like the heat wave effect, or it can be indirect. Um, uh, uh, you know, propagating, cascading through our through our systems, and and there's you know the IPCC looks at really four components to risk. One is the hazard, the climate related hazard. Uh, the other the other is how how we're exposed to that hazard. The thing we value, the thing of interest, is exposed to that hazard. Uh, and the third is the kind of sensitivity and vulnerability of that system. You know, to to the to the hazard, and and of course one of the main ways things of value are exposed to hazards is through their geography, you know, which is where spatial planning comes in, and this is why for certain kinds of impacts and risks, the spatial planning does by local government areas is so critical. So this is a big challenge. How can they now factor into their strategic planning? And how can that propagate through into their spatial plans, the accelerated kinds and more complex kind of kinds of climate risks that we're now experiencing and that will increase into the future. And Lauren, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I know this is an area of interest for you. Well, and I also know there's experts on the line here that um, could speak to this, but just to underline that land use planning is an essential tool here, not just on its own, but as an enabler of other adaptations. And I'm talking here particularly around things like infrastructure planning, large scale settlement planning. And these have both adaptation and mitigation outcomes. So this is a key um, example of what we're talking about between the need to integrate adaptation and mitigation. And so we've got quite a lot to do with retrofitting existing situations, both infrastructural setups and settlement uh, distributions, et cetera. Uh, and also thinking about what to do uh, alternatively. So it's a key kind of battleground, if you like, for this. And it's an important one that we get right, because as I said, it leads to a lot of uh, flow on effects uh, in terms of enabling or inhibiting other positive adaptations and mitigations. Yeah, great. Thanks, Lauren. I want to throw the next question to you, Greta. Uh, so the question is really around, will we know within the next four years if we're able to meet the one and a half degrees? Um, but you know, the, from our mitigation efforts, you know, how does that match with our current um, carbon budget? I know that's important in terms of coral reefs. So yeah. thoughts from you? That might actually be something that Kevin is better able mm. to answer in a more detailed way on Friday. 
just to put a plug in there for your <laughs> webinar. However, um, meeting the or limiting warming to 1.5 degrees is technically feasible, just like by skinny your teeth, just. Um, so it, it is possible and would require a, you know, an, a, a massive effort to do that. However, whatever we can do, so every fraction of a degree of warming that we can avoid is pain and suffering avoided. So even though we have targets um, for very good reasons, you know, achieving whatever reduction in warming that we can is absolutely a worthwhile effort. Yeah, yeah that's, um, that's really the key point. So the Working Group 1 report that came out last year said under all projections where it's 50-50 at the moment, it's still technically, as Greta said, it's still technically possible to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, like precisely, but uh, you know, some slippage over that is as likely or not. But again, you know, the way I like to think of it, it's like a thermometer, right, from, that we put under our tongue or under our armpit to get a to get some indicator of the health of our body. So a healthy human temperature is what 37.8 degrees. Um, if you're 39 degrees, you're quite sick. If you're 40, you've got a life-threatening fever. Well, people don't say, oh, one degree is only, you know, 40 is only a little bit more than 37.8. It's nothing to worry about. Well, that's the way we should interpret this levels of global warming. You know, 1.5 degrees is, is actually the equivalent of 40 degrees, right? Uh, a healthy temperature for Earth was, 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 um, was zero degrees above pre-industrial levels, right? So, so we're at 1.1. 1.1 1 .1 is, you know, we've, we've, we've definitely got a temperature and we're very sick. 1.5, things are going to be lost. There's going to be irre irrecoverable loss and damage. But as Greta said, and this is also, if you read the summary for decision makers, this is one of the high level messages that every increment of global warming has, you know, makes a difference. So it's not like we can't achieve 1.5 there, we just stick our heads in the sand and forget about it. If we can limit it to one point, you know, whatever, above 1.5, where, you know, we're, we're ahead of where, where we would be. We're currently heading to two degrees plus. And if you look at the risk assessments, climate risk assessments in the in the summary for policymakers, which gives a global synthesis, um, there are, you you will be hard pressed to find a human or natural system which is not at the highest level of risk of two degrees. Uh, so you know it isn't just a matter of you know all or nothing at 1.5. Every increment counts. Every 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 greenhouse gas emission we can avoid counts. And Another Greta? thing to remember there too is that that's a global average and that there is a very big difference in the rates of, of warming and other, other hazards of, of climate change across the planet. And on Friday, Kevin will be able to give us more detailed updates on, on, on the values of warming around Australia um, because we are warming faster than the, the global average in the north and in the southeast and southwest. That's in, in marine systems anyway. Yeah. Thanks, Greta. And we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I just want to ask one final question. Apologies to those who have put questions in that we haven't got to, but a plug for Friday. This conversation continues on Friday, so if you can join us, um, we'll look at these questions before then and see if there's um, some additional things we can address. But the question is, you know, um, how has uh, the Australasia region um, uh, turned up compared to other parts of the globe and you, you talked about the faster warming you know how, how are we looking in terms of the rest of the globe Greta do you want to start there in terms of many of the extreme events for example Australia was very much at the at the, the pointy end in terms of you know coral reef systems temperate reef systems alpine um, systems as well and then fire and flood risk all of those kinds of impacts we have socioeconomic advantages compared to other parts of the world that are also at the high end I was reading some summary statements from Africa um, this morning and that was fairly sobering uh, information so although you know in many ways Australia 
is at the high end of impacts and extreme events, the way we, the capacity that we have to deal with those is, is much higher than other parts of the world. Yeah, Lauren, I, do you want, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry Brendan, I'll just get Lauren to jump in and then I'll get you to finish if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, sorry, I was just going to um, compliment what uh, Greta was saying by pointing out that, of course, you know, dealing at these regional level, national level disguises all sorts of variation. And uh, we have to remember there's extreme inequalities in Australia. Um, and also, of course, that vulnerabilities are very, very dynamic. And I think, you know, when we look at some of the ways recent events are playing out, uh, people are part of the shock is just... Um, the kind of gaps that it's showing in uh, some of our capacity. So we have capacities definitely, as Greta said, uh, we haven't necessarily implemented them particularly well. Uh, and we have huge uh, challenges when it comes to actually reducing inequalities. Great, thanks Lauren. And final word from you, Brendan. Yeah, yeah thanks. So I think, you know, putting Australia in a, so I've got a number of ride on mowers going on around me. I don't know if you can hear them. <laughs> no. Okay, that's good. Uh, so putting Australia in that global context, to me, again, this was one of the big differences between AR5 and AR6. And then I think in AR5, there was still this overall sense that it was poor and developing countries, the people in poor and developing countries that were at most at risk from climate change. And, 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 and that the developed, it wasn't, uh, adaptation wasn't an issue that developed countries really had to worry about. And, and I think this assessment, you know, if people are still of that, of that view, I hope after they've read uh, our, our assessment that they are dispelled of that because it's simply not true. Uh, as, as Lauren has said, we've got social disparities within our country. That means we've got particularly vulnerable social groups. And, and as Greta has pointed out, we are more than, it, it, you, you'll be hard pressed to find a region that has been more physically impacted by climate change than, than, than we have. So uh, there is nowhere to hide. Being a wealthy country helps in that you've potentially got the capacity to bring to, more capacity to bring to bear. But we should um, you know, no longer delude ourselves that adaptation is something only for poor developing countries. It's now an imperative for developed countries like Australia as well. Brilliant. Great note to finish on. Can I just ask you all to give a virtual applause for our um, panellists today? Thanks, Lauren, for jumping in. Um, thank you, Brendan and Greta, for really interesting and um, uh, important presentations. We look forward, hopefully, to seeing many of you again on Friday, where we'll continue this conversation. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.